Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from today. Welcome to our Tuesday live stream to cover all things related to digital transformation. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO and founder of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. And today's topic for today's live stream is inside the mind of a career technology consultant. We're going to dive into the good, the bad, the ugly about consulting, whether you're an aspiring consultant or perhaps you're a consultant that's mid-career just looking for general career advice, or if you're part of an organization that's looking to hire a consulting firm. We're going to talk about all the things that make for successful consultants and things you should be thinking about, both in terms of hiring consultants potentially and or in terms of furthering your career as a consultant or getting started in a career in consulting. A um, couple of logistical things before we jump in and, and take audience questions and, and dive into the meat of the conversation is, first of all, this live stream is something I host every Tuesday. So same time, same place. We're streaming to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So whichever platform you're listening or watching on, thanks for being here today. Um, secondly, this live discussion becomes part of my weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast, which gets released every Wednesday with new episodes. You can find that on audio podcast platforms throughout the world. And you can also find new episodes streaming on uh, every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter as well. So thank you for being part of the live production of our podcast here today. This discussion that we're having today will become part of the podcast that is released a week from tomorrow. So Wednesday of next week, uh, the podcast that is released will feature this discussion as part of that episode. So thank you for being part of that, that production. And uh, also, if you don't mind, just drop in the chat where you're joining from today. I'd love to hear where this global digital tr transformation community is joining us from today. Just drop uh, in the chat if you don't mind what city and country you're in, just so I know uh, where everyone's from and what parts of the world you might be in and joining from here today. And uh, speaking of chat, too, in addition to dropping in the chat where you're joining us from today, I'd also love to hear uh, any questions or comments you have. So even though the topic here today is inside the mind of a career technology consultant, which is referring to me, um, I'm actually hoping to get a lot of feedback and interaction from those of you that might be in consulting or might have interaction or exposure to consultants uh, in general. I'd love to hear uh, some general feedback from you um, if you have any feedback or questions as it relates to uh, consulting as well. So thank you in advance for asking questions and, and being engaged in the conversation here today. So uh, as I mentioned, today's topic is inside the mind of a career technology consultant. And I'll be honest, it's sort of a dark little secret of mine is that I am a big fan of um, crime shows. So any show that has to do with serial killers and crime in general, I just love those kind of shows. I'm not sure why, but I do. I haven't really taken the time to psychoanalyze why that is. But uh, today's topic is meant to be sort of a spin or a play on that that whole concept. There's a, there's a TV show called Inside the Mind of a Serial Killer. Uh, which is what gave me the idea for inside the mind of a career technology consultant. Now, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but just to clarify, I am not a serial killer, and I'm assuming that most consultants are not serial killers, but um, I really wanted to use this as an opportunity to dive into the good, the bad, the ugly about consulting, because there's some things that I love about consulting. Um, there's reasons why I chose consulting as a career, and maybe the same is true for many of you that are consultants joining uh, on the call here today. Um, but there's also dark sides to it too, uh, in terms of certain people or certain personality types aren't going to like consulting. And also if you're an organization that's looking to hire a consulting firm, there's just things to be aware of, um, in terms of the ethics and the, the general behaviors of consultants in general that to be aware of. So my, my goal here today is to be as candid and forthcoming in the good, the bad, the ugly about career consultants and, uh, just tech technology consulting in general. So be sure. Before I jump into um, just some maybe some starting point questions that I, I often receive, I have a sort of a list of questions that I'm going to start with here today that are some of the most frequently asked questions that I get when I'm when I get someone who's asking for career advice or they just want to know in general, you know, what are what are some things to be aware of when becoming a consultant? How do I become a consultant? If I'm hiring a consultant, how do I manage the consultants? What should I look for when evaluating potential consultants? That's all the kind of stuff I want to cover here today. I'm going to start with some of the common questions that I commonly get from people that are either hiring consultants or looking to, to me for career advice. And as I mentioned, I would love to hear feedback from the audience here today, too. So any thoughts you have, um, even if you're not a consultant or you, you have some exposure to consultants in the past, I'd love to hear your feedback here. So before I jump into my points, though, or my kind of starting point questions, I'd love to turn to the audience here and, and thank you, everyone who's already dropped in the chats 
the various streams here of where you're joining from today. Um, we have people from all over the world, as I mentioned before. We have uh, someone from LinkedIn on uh, someone from LinkedIn from Germany, um, someone from LinkedIn uh, Lake, I believe is how the name is pronounced, from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Dallas is joining from Utah. Ryan from Denver. Uh, Brent from Saratosa, Florida. Gassan joining from Kuwait. Pranay from India. Uh, Super Rerun is the handle name from Berlin, Germany. Um, Tawana from Sweden. Uh, someone from New Delhi. Someone from uh, Burkina Faso in West Africa. I am not familiar with that country, and you might be the first person from Burkina Faso to, to join us here today. Uh, Mark from Belize, uh, Karen from Dublin, thank you all for being here today, and thank you for dropping in the chat where you're joining from today. Um, and if you haven't already, I'd love to still hear where you're joining from today if you're just joining us, and uh, also love to hear questions or comments you have along the way. So what I thought we'd do today in terms of getting started is – you know, one of the the real simple questions that might be a good way to get started in today's conversation is why would someone want to be a consultant? You know, what are some of the reasons why I myself became a consultant and others that I've worked with throughout the years? Why would they want to become a consultant? And just to give you some backdrop, I've been a consultant my entire career. I, I don't know any other profession other than consulting, which is could be good news or bad news, depending on, on how you look at it. Um, I started in the late 90s in Quite honestly, it was a career that I did not choose or have intention of getting into uh, early on, at least especially from the perspective of being a technology consultant. I sort of resisted the idea of being a technology consultant in the late 90s because I didn't want to be perceived as a techie, and that wasn't really the career path I wanted to go down. But through a series of unpredictable twists and turns, I end up as a, a technology consultant, uh, not by choice necessarily, but I'm really glad it worked out that way. And some of the general reasons why I became a consultant and why, for me personally, why I love consulting is for a number of reasons. I mean, one is that the variety of work is spectacular. I mean, you, you constantly get new challenges and new opportunities. You're engaging with new organizations, new industries, new people, new cultures. Uh, in some cases, if you're fortunate enough to work internationally, which I've, I've been very fortunate to work internationally over the years, you get to experience different geographic cultures and just different parts of the world and travel and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of really cool stuff about consulting that on the surface, at least can make it very fun. And so that's one thing that if you like variety of work, if you like to experience new challenges and constantly be learning, um, consulting is a, is a great career. I, I don't feel like I'm learning any less now than when I started. So even day one of being a consultant, I was learning a lot. I was drinking from a fire hose and 25 years later, I still am learning a lot and drinking from a fire hose because you're just constantly, if you're doing it right, you're constantly listening and learning and understanding different scenarios and different situations that maybe you've never seen before. And what's really fun about it is you can you get the opportunity to apply some of your experience and lessons to new experiences in, in new situations, which is part of what makes consulting a lot of fun. So that variety, the constant learning are, are two uh, very cool things. If you if you like to travel, um, there's there's constantly opportunities to travel. Even in today's post COVID world, um, travel is a necessity in most cases for consulting, regardless of what mainstream thoughts might be around working from home and working from anywhere. Consulting, in my opinion, is very much an in person, face to face sort of uh, proposition. Not necessarily Monday through Friday like it used to be back in the day. Um, I don't. I think that's a bit excessive and a bit overkill, but having some human interaction and face-to-face -face and travel uh, is still, in my opinion, very important to being an effective consultant and really understanding a client, their operations, their personalities, um, and just getting to know, you know, the different people that you have to deal with as a, as a consultant. So those are some of the things that in my opinion are, are sort of the positives of why you might want to be a consultant. For me personally, you know, one thing I was concerned about knowing about myself, even early in my career is that I get, I get bored very easily. I don't like to do the same thing for, extended periods of time and consulting was a perfect way for me to avoid that weakness or avoid that quirk in my personality, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and I love to learn. And so I, you know, I can't think of a whole lot of professions where you can learn as much as you do in consulting, not just in terms of formalized learning and training, but also in my opinion, even more importantly, is just learning from doing consulting and learning about different organizations and industries and technologies and all that good stuff. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to be a consultant, but I'd love to hear from the audience, especially for those of you that are consultants, or maybe you've been consultants in the past, or maybe you're aspiring to be one. 
what are some of the reasons why consulting appeals to you or why you think people might want to be might, might want to be involved in, in consulting? Um, and, and I'm already getting some comments here, which are really good ones that I'm going to get to here as it relates to that. Um, I guess on, on LinkedIn says uh, to consult or not to consult. That's the question. Um, my bias opinion is consult rather than not consult, but um, that's that's my personal preference. And it's it's not for everyone. I'm going to get to the I mean, in a moment. I'll talk about why it's not for everyone. But that's a great, great way to frame it there, I guess on. Um, also, uh, whoops, one second here having an issue. There we go. Also on LinkedIn, and this is, uh, I'll mispronounce the name. If I mispronounced it the first time, I'm probably going to mispronounce your name again uh, for a second time. And I apologize for that, but I'm gonna say Lake um, on LinkedIn. If I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize. Um, Lake says, same for me, I know nothing else. So I'm glad I'm not alone. I'm not the only person here on this discussion that uh, knows nothing other than uh, been consulting. So that's good to, good to have uh, someone to commiserate with here. Um, another interesting uh, point here from um, Dallas on LinkedIn, uh, Dallas says unbridled passion and curiosity. Usually it just falls into place if it's going to work. And I, I think that's really well said. I like uh, the, the concept or the, the phrase unbridled passion and curiosity. I think that's something you have to have as a consultant if you want to be good at it. Um, if you ever stop losing or if you ever lose that passion for, for, uh, just learning and you lose that curiosity. And if you ever get to the point where you feel like you have all the answers and you're done learning, then you should probably stop being a consultant at that point is, is my opinion. If I ever, I've always told myself, if I ever feel like I'm getting bored with consulting or I'm not curious, I'm not listening, I'm not trying to understand anymore. If I feel like I'm too smart or smarter than everyone I'm consulting to, and it's not worth it, then I, I should just stop consulting because I'm not going to be good at it at that point, in my opinion. I think that's a really important part of consulting is to have that uh, passion and curiosity. So thank you for that that feedback, uh, Dallas. Um, another uh, just quick, more of a question here from um, Schellender on LinkedIn. And I apologize, I'm probably going to mispronounce many people's names today if I haven't already. So um, Schellender, Schellender um, on LinkedIn asked the question, is formal technology education or such academic credentials a prerequisite for being a technology consultant? Um, I'd say yes and no. I mean, it certainly is one path. I mean, if you have technology credentials and academic credentials, it doesn't hurt by any means, but that's not the only path to get there. There's a lot of other ways you can become an effective technology consultant. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that I actually resisted the idea of becoming a technology consultant because I thought of myself more as a a strategy and business consultant. I went and got my master's degree in business and I thought I was going to be more of like a operation strategy, um, organizational strategy sort of consultant. And it took me a while to figure out and realize that I'm actually am a strategy consultant. I actually am an organizational consultant. I'm doing all the things that I wanted to do, but on the surface, I'm a tech consultant. Um, and technology, you can't really separate technology nowadays from strategy or organizational strategy or operations and all that stuff. So technology just, especially today, is a part of all of that. But I think when you peel back the onion and, and really dig into what a consultant does, uh, when you're a technology consultant, it's more business and organizational focused, or it should be if you're if you're good at it, you should be more focused on organizational and operational and strategic aspects of consulting. Even if you're a deep technical person, you need to have that understanding. And so I think having the, there's other education or credentials you can develop or other skill sets you can develop to become an effective technology consultant. And a lot of those skill sets don't have a lot to do with technology. So, for example, if you were to we, we hire a lot of consultants and one thing that, that I that I look for that actually stands out on resumes when I see resumes that come across my desk for candidates on our team is um, someone who has like a Lean Six Sigma background, if they're certified in Lean Six Sigma doesn't really have a whole lot to do with technology, if anything to do with technology, but it's a skill set that's really important that's very transferable into tech consulting. Because if you can understand operations and how to improve operations, be more efficient, be more lean and all that good stuff, you're just gonna, that gives you a good set, solid foundation to build on. And you can learn the technical stuff along the way. So I think that's uh, something that's important to note too, is there's no one path to becoming a technology consultant, but the key is to understand where you can transfer some of your skills and backgrounds into becoming an effective technology consultant 
and also just more fully understanding what a technology consultant really is. What does that really mean? I think too often consultants get a little myopically focused on an area of specialization and they don't really look beyond that. Um, and one of the questions I'm going to get to here in a moment is balancing the need for specialization and digging deep and understanding an area very well versus having more of a breadth of understanding, more of a business and in general strategic understanding of how an organization works. Those are two different competing skill sets that you need to develop, not that you can't develop both or, or nurture both of those angles, both the specialization and the breadth. Over time, you can do both. But when you're getting started, oftentimes you have to specialize in an area just to just to get going or just to sort of build that niche for yourself. But even if you have that niche and that depth and that specialization, I would argue it's very important to have a breadth of, of knowledge to back that too. So I think that the good news with that is it gives you a lot of options for how you might get into consulting. The key though, in terms of getting in front of hiring decision makers and consulting firms that might hire you, the key is to figure out how to make sure you clearly transfer or articulate how your skill set and your background is uniquely positioned to help you be a better consultant. So that would be my my one caveat to that is there's a lot of different paths you can use to get to consulting, but you just want to make sure you position it in a way that that's going to appeal to decision makers that are um, hiring, whether you're trying to become part of a consulting firm or whether you're a, an independent one man or one woman consultant that's trying to sell your services to to another organization. So another interesting comment here from uh, Laik again on, on LinkedIn, uh, working as an ERP developer was boring, so wanted to keep it interesting by following my passion for consulting. Um, if I were ever a developer, I would probably share that same sentiment. I was never a developer, but um, I would be a terrible developer just to be candid. So you don't want me touching code or being a developer because that just wouldn't be wouldn't be fun for anyone. But I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I'm in the same boat. And uh, if I had been a developer, I, I probably would have moved into consulting. But I think being a developer, though, having that deep technical experience is just a unique angle that you can really use to your advantage. Because now when you start talking about more general functional consulting, or if you become more of a business process or organizational consultant, having that technical understanding is really helpful. And in one of the interesting stories that happened early in my career, and it's one of those moments in life where you, at the moment you think it's a terrible thing, but then you look back and realize that that was actually a really good thing that happened, was that I was working for Pricewaterhouse and, and the partner I worked for at Pricewaterhouse um, sent me to a six week uh, SAP certification course. So I became, and I still am technically certified in SAP. I don't tell a lot of people that because third stage consulting is independent technology agnostic. We're not affiliated with SAP. We do a lot of stuff other than SAP. In fact, most of our work is non SAP, although quite a bit of it is SAP nowadays. But still, that partner sent me to get certified in SAP. Um, SAP R3 at the time was the, the software. And so I was certified in material management and production planning. So I was more on the manufacturing side. And that was just the area that they they wanted me to go get certified in. I didn't really, I didn't choose that. And I didn't want to do it because I thought, why would I do this if I'm going to be a, what I wanted to be was an organizational change consultant. And I'm really glad I did it because I was the only change management consultant at that time on the teams I worked on early on that had been certified in SAP. And they didn't ask me to do configuration. I never really spent a lot of time building software and that sort of thing. But just knowing the guts of how SAP worked and how the software we're deploying works was really helpful in, in a change management capacity because I had a lot more credibility. I could speak to the technology. I understood it better. And in some ways, I understood operations better, um, especially at that point in my career. I was young and you know 24 years old or whatever I was. And I hadn't had much, if any, real world manufacturing experience and that sort of thing. But through that certification, I sort of learned um, how material management and MRP and production planning and just general manufacturing worked. And so when I would do change management for manufacturing clients, I just had that, you know, more, a more immediate understanding than that, than most people at that point in their careers. So I think um, really understanding, maybe, you know, leveraging some of the skills you have. I think most people here listening in or, or being part of this conversation probably have some more relevant skills than you might realize that can be transferable into consulting. And hopefully we'll get to some more examples of that uh, as we go here. Um, here's an interesting question from 
uh, Dale on LinkedIn, he asked the question of how do I get from zero clients to one plus clients? Um, and I would say, having now started two consulting firms and run two different consulting firms over the last 17 years or whatever I've been doing this for um, on my own, um, getting the first one is typically the hardest, um, getting that first client, but then, you know, building a client base beyond one is another, you know, big milestone as well. So I think the key is really, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can market yourself or get your, get your services out there, certainly through networking now with technology like LinkedIn and um, other social networking tools. Um, it's a lot easier now than when I started my career to, to find that business and to get started. Um, when I started my previous company back in 2005, I relied heavily on writing blogs. I just started a blog in 2005, right when I started that company, which now doesn't sound that crazy or that innovative, but at the time there wasn't anyone blogging about the stuff that I was blogging about, which was ERP and how to be successful in ERP. And that blog became very popular over the years. And then over time, other, you know, other consultants and B2B organizations started blogging and it became more common. And now it's no big deal to have a blog. Everyone has a blog. Uh, but at the time, that was a way to sort of differentiate myself and, and, and position myself as a, as a thought leader and someone that people could turn to for advice. And then when I started third stage back in 2018, I shifted my strategy a bit and focused more on video. And so that's where I started my YouTube channel. Um, I already had the YouTube channel, but I rarely posted videos. Um, so I just started posting videos ad hoc or sort of erratically on, on YouTube. And then I realized that it was getting traction. And then I, you know, I stepped up the production quality and frequency of the videos to where now I'm publishing almost every day. There's new videos uh, showing up on my YouTube channel. So, um, that's just one example or two examples of ways you can position yourself, but you don't have to be on video. You don't have to be, um, writing. You could also present at conferences. It could be just more networking, but anything you do to establish credibility and get in front of, uh, and get in front of potential clients is something that can be very, very helpful. Mark from LinkedIn has some in, an interesting comment here. He says, very similar experience here. Love the new challenges and learning new fields while doing similar work, but I also really enjoy helping people. And that's actually a really good point. That's something that um, I overlooked in my opening comments about why I love consulting or why someone might want to be a consultant is if you genuinely like helping people and help, helping organizations, it's, it's super rewarding in that regard. And it, and that's another one that took me a while to realize in my career as a consultant is that you're not just doing, you're not just doing a task within a statement of work, which I think, you know, we all have to do as consultants. You have to have a statement of work that clearly defines what it is you're going to do, what deliverable a client's going to get, how much it's going to cost, all that stuff. You have to obviously have that clarity, but, when you really look under the surface of what you're really providing to clients, oftentimes it's not the deliverable that's in the statement of work. And I'm not suggesting that you should just go do whatever you want and get out of scope and spend the client's money or build the client as much as you want. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is there's a, there's an art to it that can't be captured in a statement of work. And one of the art, the art pieces of consulting, in my opinion, is helping people um, and maybe just to frame it a little bit differently or, or phrase it a little bit differently. I'd argue that being an effective consultant requires you to be an effective amateur therapist because so much of what you do as a consultant is understand and empathize what organizations are going through. Because when you're called in as a consultant, you're typically brought in because there's some sort of business challenge or opportunity that the organization can't figure out themselves because they don't have the skill set or the bandwidth or leadership or whatever it is. And so they bring you into a situation to help. And usually when you're coming in to help, the organization is going through some sort of change, some sort of transformation that is stressful in a lot of ways. It might be exciting. There might be a lot of business value to be untapped or to, to be tapped into or unlocked, but there's still pain that goes along with that. And so you have to understand the pain. You have to understand the chaos. You have to understand the, the crazy things that people do when they're going through change and when they get stressed out. And so really helping people and helping and knowing that you can make an organization better than it was before they engaged you as a consultant is super rewarding. And there's also, you know, quite frankly, I'll just be honest, there's also a perceived an elevated perception of credibility with consultants, regardless of whether you're smarter than, than a client or, or you know more than a client, which you may, as a consultant, you may know more in your area of expertise, which is why they're hiring you. 
Um, but such a big part of that is, um, is just the outside perspective gets valued more. There's, there's so many times, I can't tell you how many times where I've been in a room and I'm presenting something to a client and it's exactly what some of those things are exactly what their own employees had told them or the, what their own employees think. But because I'm an outside consultant and I say the same things, it just has more credibility. It has more weight. People believe it more because, you know, you're not tied up in all the internal politics. They perceive you to be, a, you know, an outside expert. That's great. That's flattering. But sometimes I feel kind of bad because it's like you paid me all this money to tell you something that your employees already knew or they already sort of, you know, um, their instincts were already telling them to be the case. Um, now, certainly when it comes to execution, especially, um, that's where consultants can add a ton of value because most organizations don't know how to execute really well. And so providing that consulting um, ability to execute is something that's super uh, valuable too, it's super important. So if you like helping people, uh, consulting is a great way to look at it or a great career to pursue, I should say. Great comments here. Thank you for all the feedback and, and questions here. Um, this is from Carl on LinkedIn. Carl says, good point, Eric. Good point, Eric. Yeah, I even mispronounced my own name. So there you go. That that helps me feel better about mispronouncing everyone else's. I can't even pronounce mine right. Um, good point, Eric. Businesses need Business needs today require technology. Doing things on the back of an envelope no longer works. So that is very true. Um, any sort of, uh, even if you want to be a strategy consultant or just a general business consultant, you're going to have to know technology. Um, and that was something I, it took me a while to figure out and learn even back in the late nineties. It's even more true today. I, I can't imagine trying to be a consultant without knowing technology. Cause you, I don't know how you, I don't, I don't even know how you would consult them without, without understanding some of these emerging technologies that are affecting so many organizations and providing so much, uh, opportunity to organizations. So here's a really interesting question that I love here. This is from uh, someone named first is last on YouTube. This person says, hey there, I'm from South Africa. I was wondering if someone from a business analysis background looking to transition to consulting, what should they look into concerning the transition? Well, I'd say, first of all, if you're a business analyst, you have a really strong core foundation for being a good consultant, or at least having a skill set that can help you be a good consultant. Um, anyone who's been a business analyst in terms of um, doing you know, detailed process design or even building software, you just have sort of a detailed understanding of business or technology or organizations in a way that a lot of people don't have. And so I think, first of all, highlighting some of those skills that you've captured and some of the strengths you may have as a business analyst in a way that frames yourself or positions yourself to be a really strong potential consultant can be something that can be highly effective in, in uh, helping you break into consulting. So I'd say you're on the right track. If you're a business analyst, leverage those skills, highlight those skills, showcase those skills, and then look to, you know, what could you do to augment or add to that business analyst background to make you a, a better consultant, whether it's more technical knowledge or maybe knowing a little bit more about organizational change or whatever the uh, case may be. Program management is another one. If you can get PMP courses or PMP certification, those are other um, good skill sets and, and qualifications to have as well. Now, one thing I want to cover too, we've sort of talked about the positives of consulting, but I think it's worth talking about why would someone not want to be a consultant? And um, this is really important too. I think, you know, self-selecting out of the consulting field is just as important. If it's not a good fit for you, that's just as important as being able to self-select in if it, if you are going to be good at it, or it is something you, you're going to enjoy. So, you know, I'll give you some examples of scenarios I've seen where people don't like consulting. Um, in no particular order, some of the things that come to mind, and I'm curious to hear from all of you too, you know, what have you seen? Are, if there's things you don't like about consulting or you don't think you like about consulting, I would love to hear. Or if you've hired consultants and um, you've worked with consultants in the past, what are some of the things that you don't like about consulting or that you've seen others not like about it? I'd love to hear your feedback. But I'll start with just sort of my laundry list of things why or reasons why you might not like, might not like consulting. Um, one is if you don't like travel. Um, that's something that is actually strangely enough, becoming a real big problem for us recruiting right now is that there's just a lot of people out there that want to be a consultant, but they just don't want to travel. They, they've really bought into this work from home, work from anywhere mindset, which I get. And we've, we've always, even pre COVID, we at third stage have always had more of a hybrid model where yes, we're in an office. I'm in an office here today, as you can see behind me, 
Um, we have an office here that's kind of a hoteling situation where people, when they're not on the road, can come in the office. We collaborate, all that good stuff. Um, but we don't require people to be here Monday through Friday. We don't require travel Monday through Friday. Uh, people have flexibility, work from home, all that good stuff. So we, we do have a balance here. But like I mentioned before, having that in-person human interaction is so important, you know, to be able to collaborate more effectively, um, to be able to collaborate effectively amongst yourselves, but also with consultants. Um, I don't want to open a whole can of worms here, but my personal opinion is that the work from anywhere movement is overrated uh, and overstated. I think that so much human, human interaction, especially in consulting, is it needs to be in person, not because I'm old school, not because I don't believe in Zoom meetings and technology to, to do a lot of that work, because we, we use it very heavily. We use technology very heavily to collaborate, but that occasional in-person meeting, you just cannot, I don't care what anyone says, you cannot replicate that on a Zoom meeting. The sidebar conversations, the walking the shop floor, talking to people, side conversations, all that stuff, the really important nuances of understanding a client as a consultant needs to be in person to some degree. And people that don't like to travel aren't probably going to like consulting. And some people just don't like travel because they've got kids or they're at that point in life where they just don't want to travel. So travel in consulting is not nearly as glamorous as it sounds. I think a lot of people think that's really cool. You get to stay in nice hotels and eat fancy meals and go to glamorous cities. But in reality, most of the time I'm traveling, I'm in a rural town in a, in a courtyard Marriott. Nothing wrong with courtyard Marriott. I actually love courtyard Marriott's. But you're at a courtyard Marriott eating, you know, takeout not eating well, you know, tr trying to struggle to get a workout in all that stuff. So it's not, it's not nearly as glamorous as it sounds. I love it. I do love traveling. I love going to all parts of the world, no matter where it is and experiencing new things. But if you don't like that, then you're not going to like travel um, or you're not going to like consulting, I should say. So travel is one thing. If you don't like to constantly learn, if you feel like you need to master something and sort of get comfortable in that master, that mastery of something, then consulting is probably not for you because my opinion is that cons the worst consultants are the ones that stop learning and they gave up on learning. They, they have all the answers. They're the smartest people in their profession and they don't need to learn anymore. And when you have that mentality, I think it's time to check out and go do something else uh, because that means you're not listening. You're not, you're not trying to understand uh, the nuances of, of an individual client and you're coming in with a predefined answer based on, based on your experience. And I've seen a lot of consultants that get to like the point I am, or maybe even a little bit further in their careers where they've been doing it for so long. It's like, you know, they, they know, they know business and technology like the back of their hands and they just stop listening and they stop learning. Um, and usually it's not, you know, because they're arrogant or pompous, although sometimes it is, uh, usually it's because they really do think they've learned all there is to learn. And, and I think that's a dangerous place to be as a consultant. So if you don't like to learn, if you get stressed out by constant unpredictability, uh, you're probably not going to like consulting. Um, consulting can be stressful too, because you're often the scapegoat. There's a lot of pressure on you because you were brought in to fix a problem that a company couldn't figure out themselves. And in many cases they failed at, and in many cases people got fired over. Now they're going to hire you to come in and fix that problem that other people paid the price for not being able to do well. And with that comes a lot of stress and a lot of unpredictable client behavior, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of CIOs and um, CFOs and end clients we work with that sometimes they just, they get frustrated, they, they're stressed out and they take it out on you as consultants. And, it, and, and it's easy to take it personally. I used to take it very personally, but then I realized, you know what, it's not, this isn't directed at me, even though it feels like it's directed at me for a moment. What the real problem is, is that they are stressed out, they're under pressure and I need to understand how to make them feel better. And so it gets back to that whole point of being a, sort of an amateur therapist and being able to listen and understand what are they really saying? What's making this person tick and how can I make them feel better? And I, I'd argue that close to half of being an effective consultant is making your client feel good. Um, yes, you have to deliver what's in your statement of work and have reasonable billing and business value to prove that you're worth the, the amount of money you bill, but you, th that art of consulting is really listening and understanding and empathizing and knowing that this isn't personal, this is business and, uh, if someone gets mad at me, for example, I don't, I don't, I rarely take it personally. It is hard for me, I'll be honest, but um, I, I try not to as, as best as I can. So those are some reasons why not to be a consultant. I'd love to hear though from, from you all, what are some other reasons why someone might not want to be a consultant? Um, one last thing I'll kind of throw in is if you like real steady, predictable work, um, consulting is not a good fit for that because consulting is sort of, uh, you're, you're, you're following the, the, 
changes in the market. You're following the changes in businesses and they're hiring you to come in and solve a unique problem. So every project's going to be a little bit different. And if you don't like that, then you're probably not going to like consulting because that's just how it is. And that's the nature of consulting. But what, what do you all think? I'm curious to hear what, what you, what you don't like about consulting or some of the things that you think would be a negative uh, about consulting. And I'm going to go back to the chat stream here and see what comments you have about that. Another comment from like on, on LinkedIn is if you're a loan or a founder, in my opinion, partnering with the right people can be a good strategy. Totally agree with that. Um, great point. Um, we partner with a lot of, uh, independent solo contractor type consultants that enjoy being contractors. We have some people that start off as contractors and then become employees. We have some people that we hire as W2 or, or full-time employees. And then we have other people that just really have no desire to, to be an employee per se. And what's interesting, and, and that's another thing, we don't take that personally. We think, okay, if you like this contractor model, you like the flexibility, you like being self-employed, let's partner and figure out a way to work together. Um, and what's interesting is most of the people that are in that situation where they just enjoy being contractors and have no desire to be an employee, they're only doing work for third stage in, in like 90% plus of the time, just because we have so much work and they're able to help in so many different ways. So it's sort of like best of both worlds. You get to be part of a bigger team, part of something bigger than yourself. You get to be part of projects that are bigger than what any one person can do. But at the same time, you still have that flexibility and that, that sort of ownership of being self-employed and whatnot. So um, depending on the firm, I mean, some firms don't hire contractors, some firms only hire contractors, but then they want you to be sort of a, a lone wolf out on consulting engagement. So, uh, for us at third stage, we, we try to blend the best of both, you know, to pull together employees and contractors that are the right fit for a client, put them together as a cohesive team and, uh, you know, do great work for our clients. So great point there about that. Another interesting comment from Dallas here. You are representing your client under that agreement. You must be like water. Uh, interesting point. Well, well said. Um, Carl, Carl makes a comment here back to the question about how to market yourself or how to get your first client or clients. Uh, Carl says, seems like a mix of referrals, blogs, LinkedIn, videos, speaking engagements, et cetera, is important to track clients. I'd say that's absolutely true. Any, any mix, any of the above, any mix of those combinations of things, um, can be very important. Um, you know, certainly part, the partnership strategy is a good one that, that I hadn't mentioned before, but that is a good one that the, um, the previous person had mentioned as well. Um, another comment here from, from Dallas, humility helps ground yourself because sometimes it can be a straight up rush. Um, it's well said. And the humility is super important too, by the way, that's a, that's not a word I've used yet here in this conversation, but I totally agree with that. If you can be humble and have that humility, you're going to be a better consultant because you, first of all, you, you know, that you don't have all the answers, which is really weird to say, because I think a lot of times people think that as a consultant, you should have all the answers and I, and a lot of consultants. And by the way, a lot of the least effective consultants I've worked with in my career think they have all the answers. And, and I believe really strongly in this. In fact, it's something I try to vet out when I'm interviewing people. If I find that someone thinks they have all the answers, I'm probably not going to hire that person, even if they really do. It doesn't matter whether they really have the, all the answers or not, in my opinion. Uh, even in, in cases where I feel like I might have all the answers, I've seen this before with a certain client, I tell myself that I haven't um, because I'm trying to figure out, you know, how is this client different? How is this organization different? How is this person different? Um, or how is this group of people different? Um, how is this culture different? How is the potential solution for this potential client different. And no matter what you, you do, or, or regardless of what someone might argue on this point, I, I believe strongly that every situation is different and you have to have an, an open mind and you have to be humble enough to know that, yes, I've seen a lot of this sort of thing before, maybe pieces of it and other examples, but this is the first time I've seen this exact situation with this combination of problems and this combination of culture and people and all that stuff. Um, and like I said, if you get to the point where you don't have that humility, you're going to come in with the answer predefined and you're going to miss something. You're going to, you're going to create your own blind spots, which is very, um, dangerous to do in my opinion, as a consultant, especially if you're a smart person, there's no reason you should come in with a predefined answer that may, may not be the right fit for a client. I think it's important to have that humility and humility also gives you the potential to learn more too. If you, if you tell yourself, and if you know, you don't have all the answers and you don't, have everything all figured out, 
then you're just going to be more open to learning. And I think that's super important. And that's something that, um, I try to do too, even like in YouTube videos that I, that I do on my YouTube channel, um, very popular YouTube channel. I get a lot of great feedback from people on my YouTube channel and I think it has a lot of value and which is why I keep doing it. I think a lot of people benefit from it, but every time I do a video, I'm learning something. And as I'm creating video or even as I'm doing a live discussion like this, I always learn something from other people. And, um, you know, there's people that'll, I've, I've gotten messages from people that say, you're awesome. I've learned so much from you. And I'll say, well, you're awesome. I learned so much from you because you were on my live stream and I picked up A, B and C from you. And so I think that's the, the key is to really have that, that sort of, uh, that learning mindset and that, that reminder to yourself that you don't have all the answers. Cause, uh, like I said, egos and predefined answers are two of the most destructive, ineffective characteristics of, of consultants. There's a lot of really good feedback here. I apologize for the silence here because there is a ton here. I'm trying to figure out um, where to go from here. Uh, create your own blind spots. I love that. That's from Dallas on uh, LinkedIn. Thank you, Dallas. I'm glad, glad you like that. That's the first time I've used that phrase. So see, I just learned something by having this conversation. Consultants create their own blind spots. And now I can go make a whole video about that. And I can thank you all for giving me that, that idea. Um, Here's a really important two word comment here from Gassan uh, on LinkedIn. Gassan says emotional intelligence, super, super important. Um, I've had guests on my podcast on this live stream um, about emotional intelligence. I'm fascinated by that concept. And I think it's something that's uh, really, really important. It's one of the soft skills that are not highlighted enough when people go into consulting and when they get trained to become consultants. Too often training focuses on the hard skills, the tangible stuff which you need to have, but I'll take all day, every day. I will take someone who has less of a technical skill set, but more emotional intelligence. I'll take that person any day over someone that has more tangible, hard skills, but less emotional intelligence. And the reason is, is because the, the higher degree of knowledge completely gets undermined and watered down when you don't have the emotional intelligence to go along with it. So in essence, it's like you don't have the knowledge because you can't apply it effectively. So if I can find someone that has less knowledge, but they can apply it more effectively through their emotional intelligence, uh, I will take that person every time. And that's quite frankly, when I'm interviewing people, a lot of times, most of the time it's, I'm the last interview before they join our team. And all I look for is cultural fit. And I'm looking for emotional intelligence. I'm looking for those soft things. I, I do care to some degree about what you know and what experience you have and the tangible skill sets. Of course, that's important. But what I really look for is sort of that final decision point in our hiring process is emotional intelligence. Does this person listen? Do they ask good questions? Do they seem humble? Do they seem smart, but humble at the same time, which is a really hard combination to find, by the way. Um, and so that's, that's, um, you know, I think emotional intelligence is a really, a really good point. Um, here's a question I want to get to that is not from the audience here today yet from what I've seen, but it's a, it's a question I get often on social media and just in conversations with consultants, which is, uh, the question is, which is more important specialization or breadth? So in other words, should I go focus on one module within one type of software and become a technical consultant that focuses just on that? Or should I learn multiple technologies, multiple modules, uh, multiple work streams within a digital transformation, whether it's change management or project management, whatnot. Um, and I'd say there's two different answers I give you. One is when you're starting out, oftentimes specialization is good because that gives you a way to create some sort of a critical mass in a comfort zone that you can build from. So you, if you try to start off too broad, that can be overwhelming. And it's not, in my opinion, it's just not effective to try to be good at everything when you start out. So if you pick an area like change management or program management or business analyst or a certain type of technology or a certain vendor, uh, technology. Those are some examples of ways you might start to build some specialization. But what I would say is that, you know, mistake that a lot of consultants make is they stick to that specialization and don't look to broaden their skills. And so I would say whatever your specialization is, I would try to constantly be pushing the boundaries of your knowledge, not to spread yourself too thin and not to try and boil the ocean, but really just to learn more. And, you know, the more you learn about digital transformations and technology, the better you're going to be at it. And, for me personally, I'll just give you an example. I think I'm pretty good at change management. I think I'm pretty good at digital strategy, pretty good at software selection, program managing implementations. 
I'm really good at analyzing why an implementation fails because I've done so much expert witness work. So there's things like that, that I know I'm really good at, but the things I'm not good at are things like uh, data migration. I'm just not good at that. I don't know a lot about it. And I'm trying to learn more and more over time. Um, especially now with like artificial intelligence, machine learning and analytics and all the stuff that feeds from data management leads me to think that I need to know more about data management. So that's an area I'm constantly learning more about. Same with architecture, like system architecture and integration. Some of these more technical areas that I resisted so heavily early in my career. And now I find myself saying, I want to learn more about that because these are, these are my blind spots. These are my weaknesses. And that's why we have people on our team at third stage. They're much better at the technology stuff than I am, especially when it comes to architecture, data, um, data migration, integration, and all that stuff. So I think if you start off with specialization, if you're earlier in your career, you're probably going to lean more towards specialization. That's probably going to benefit you more. But as you advance in your career, I'd say breadth becomes more important. And for me, the ultimate person, the ultimate consultant is one that has all the positive characteristics I've talked about in terms of the emotional intelligence and the soft skills, but also someone who has a good combination of specialization and breadth. Um, I'm never going to find and I'm never going to be a consultant that knows everything about everything, but I can find people that know a lot about a lot of things and put them together into a team that provides a complete cohesive solution and a complete uh, comprehensive team that knows not everything, but no one knows everything, but knows a lot, can pretty much cover everything needed to be successful in a transformation. So that'd be my opinion on specialization versus breadth. But again, would love to hear uh, some of your thoughts here uh, too. One thing I want to, uh, before I turn back to audience questions too, on that thought and this thought too, I want to get to this, this next uh, sort of question or thread, which is really important because I also want to come at this from the angle of if you're not a consultant or you don't necessarily aspire to be a consultant, but you, you want to know how to manage consultants. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll broaden this question to be how to, I'll combine two questions into one here that I had. First question I had is what are some things to consider when choosing a potential consulting partner? And then this question that I put up on the screen is what are some tips for managing consultants? So I want to cover both of those things, um, things to consider when evaluating and then how to manage. And I think this is really important because if you're looking for ideas on how to find the best consulting partner, I think it is important to look at some of the tangible things we've been talking about here today so far, but it's equally important to look at some of the intangible aspects, the softer aspects of a consulting firm or a consulting team that might be a potential option for you. So for example, cultural fit, you want to hire a consulting firm that not only knows their stuff and is smart and has the skill set to apply to your transformation, but you also want someone that is a good cultural fit, someone that's not going to come in like a bull in a China shop and, and, and sort of wreck your culture or not fit into your culture. You need to hire someone who's sort of like a chameleon. They can sort of fit into different situations. And by the way, if you are a consultant looking for career advice, you also have to be a chameleon um, to be a good consultant. And if you're looking for consultants, I think you need to find those chameleons because you need people that adjust and adapt and understand and at the same time, though, you want to know they've got experience and depth and can apply some of their lessons and experiences to your situation to be more effective and to help you be more effective. So I think that's something that's um, important to look at when you're evaluating consultants is the, the cultural fit. Um, also, just sort of the the overall approach and philosophy of the consulting firm or the consultant. Again, if it's someone that has too much of a cookie cutter approach, that's probably not a good idea. Um, even though it sounds good in theory, it generally doesn't work to come in with, with the answer. You can certainly come in with your tool set and have your toolbox and know that I've got these hundred different ways I could do things or that I've seen things work and maybe 30 or 40 of those tools in my toolbox are going to work here, but I know how to mix and match and when to pull and what to pull from that toolbox. And that's something that's really important to look for when you're evaluating or, or hiring consultants. Um, is that flexibility. And then certainly you want at the same time, though, you also want to know that they've got a methodology, they've got an approach, they've got a repeatable process, but you also want to see the flexibility within that to know that it's going to fit your, your situation. Um, and then the other thing too, that in my opinion is super important. It's the whole reason I started third stage consulting is independence. And so someone that's independent and not tied to the software vendors, someone who's not trying to sell you technology, someone that's not trying to sell you on one sort, certain type of technology is really important because bias is one of the killers in consulting. People that are biased that come in with 
a predefined answer either because that's all they know or even worse it's because how they're paid which is true for most of the consulting industry most consultants are paid somehow by software vendors to influence decision making through and, and it's not even just the software selection process by the way it's also even during implementation it's just as prevalent in implementation you get consultants that are biased they're commissioned by software vendors they're economic incentive is to grow the footprint of one certain technology as much as possible, even if it's not the right fit for the organization. In today's day and age, it's rare to find any one technology that's going to be the perfect fit for an entire organization. And so you want to know you've got an advisor that's coming in and helping you execute, define and execute a strategy that makes the most sense for you and isn't influenced by a commission that's being received uh, or an incentive that's being received from the software vendors. And so that independence, lack of bias, in my opinion, is super important. And it's probably the one thing that's the most missing and the biggest problem in the tech consulting space is that bias. Um, I think that's a huge problem. And it's part of why, why I started third stage, quite frankly. And it's something that really bothered me earlier in my career. From the start, it bothered me that we were so biased and we were doing things that didn't feel like we're in clients' best interest, even though clients were paying us to do so. But the problem was we also had competing a competing clients essentially, which were the vendors who wanted you and expected you to go in and tow the company line as it relates to a certain technology or whatever the case may be. I remember when I first, um, the first software selection I was involved with at Price Waterhouse, I remember it was a, it was a fortune 500 company. It was here in the Denver area, which is where I'm based. Um, and they, the consulting engagement was for over a million dollars for us to come in and assess the operations and make recommendations on what the technological roadmap going forward would be. Sounds straightforward enough. We do that all the time here at third stage, right? We, we do these big evaluations for big complex companies, make recommendations, nothing wrong with that on the surface. But the problem was, and this is early, early in my career, within the first six months of being in it, in the consulting field. And I remember being fairly excited that I get to learn about all these different technologies we're going to evaluate and all this good stuff. And it turns out that um, we knew from day one that our recommendation was going to be SAP because we had a big SAP practice and we had a tight partnership with SAP uh, in the office I worked out of. And it just felt weird that we were getting paid a million dollars to come up with the answer that we already, we already had the answer. Um, we just had to figure out how to justify the answer. Um, I don't know if the client knew that or, you know, how important that was to the client at that time, but I just knew that, I started asking questions like, why is that? How is that okay? And it was highly frowned upon. Uh, and I learned very quickly um, through negative reinforcement at, at that company that you don't ask questions. You don't question the machine. You don't question the way things are. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I sort of justified it in my own mind by thinking, well, that must just be this team I'm on, or that just must, must be this part of the organization I'm in. But then I learned that's just how the whole company works. Then I realized it's not even just my company. The, the entire industry works that way. The entire industry is wired to promote certain products and to sort of come in with a hardened position on what the technological answers should be. And so that's really why I started the first company in 2005 that I started. And then third stage in 2018 was to uh, provide an independent alternative to, to some of these big consulting firms that were um, you know, peddling solutions that may not have been good fits for clients. So I want to get to some some other questions here in these last few minutes, um, other than my own. Um, you know, here's I'm, I'm going to do sort of a lightning round and try and get real quick answers to as many of these as I can, just in the interest of time, because there's a lot I haven't gotten to. Uh, Carl on LinkedIn asks, what is the mix of client needs that, you're, that you encounter in the field for facilitation versus consulting? Um, I think that facilitation is very common. It's probably not as common as consulting per se. But I would argue that the facilitation piece of it enables a lot of the consulting because you're facilitating, you're getting inputs and understanding, and the better you can facilitate, the better you can then turn and consult. So you may spend less time doing facilitation, but it's a really important input into the broader uh, piece of consulting that you might might be doing there. Another uh, comment from... Uh, Shylander on LinkedIn says consultants may have to work across industries and sometimes consultants may be labeled as shallow or something lacking in depth or rigor. This may be challenging if your client point of contact is a domain expert in that industry. Great point. Um, that is something that's very true. If you have a highly specialized industry that your client is in, 
and you don't have a lot of experience in that industry, or there's a technical area that your client knows better, then there is a risk that you become perceived as inferior or not as high value. And so the key here is to, you know, I, I just embrace the weaknesses I have. I say, I'm not an expert in this area. Here's where I am an expert. Here's where you, Mr. or Mrs. Client are an expert. Let's put our skill sets together to figure this out together. And I think as long as you do that and don't proclaim to have all the answers and to be better, to have more knowledge than a client, you're going to be fine. Most, most clients I work with understand when you say, I'm not an expert in this area. Here's where I am an expert. Here's where you can help us. And by the way, if neither one of us can figure this out or don't have the skill set that we need, we have other team members we can bring in that do. So I think just having those sorts of options and those sort of candid conversations are an important part of consulting. And it's something that, uh, it's something that builds trust too. I think a lot of times if, if you're human and you acknowledge what you do and don't know, um, people trust you more because you actually are a human. You're not just trying to be a fancy consultant that has all the answers. Um, and I'm always amazed. And sometimes I'm still fascinated by the fact that, um, I actually, I think I'm a fairly smart person, maybe slightly above average, but that has nothing to do with why I'm a good consultant or why I think I'm a good consultant. I think I'm a good consultant because I know what I'm not good at and I'm okay admitting it. And I ask a lot of questions and I try to understand, and I know that every client situation is different. And I, I think I'm pretty good at empathizing with clients. So it's that sort of thing that uh, I think is really important to becoming a good consultant. Uh, one of the comments here is we could talk for hours on that point. We could talk for hours on this topic for sure. And in fact, I had a whole list of questions and I got through maybe 30% of the questions I had to start um, just because there were so many great discussion points here. Um, so I know I haven't gotten through a lot of these questions and comments and I, I wanna thank you very much for this. I've read most of them and I'm gonna go back and read more of them and we'll probably steal some of these questions for social media purposes, if you don't mind and future podcasts and or YouTube videos. Uh, or, you know, follow me on TikTok or Instagram as well. I, I post stuff, you know, short videos on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube shorts as well. Um, and these are, these are some great questions that I, you might see pop up there. So thank you for all these great questions. Um, and if there is anything that, um, if there's anyone here that's interested in consulting careers, I highly encourage you uh, to think about third stage consulting. We're growing very quickly, running 5,000 fastest growing companies in America. Uh, we're actually growing faster even faster now than we were when we made that list. So I'm curious to see how, how we, how we fare on that list going forward, but we're high growth. We're hiring aggressively. We've got about 70 people right now throughout the world and we're, we're hiring. So uh, if, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, or you can email work at thirdstage.com. Um, and it's thirdstage dash consulting.com, I should say. So work at thirdstage, T H I R D stage dash consulting.com. If you send your resume there, that goes into our, our recruiting team. Um, but you can also try to ping me on LinkedIn and um, try to get my attention. I get a lot of messages on LinkedIn, but um, I've actually, we've actually hired people that have messaged me on LinkedIn and I, I sort of elevate them in the queue in our recruiting category. If it's someone I think could be a really good fit. So I know people I could, I can make stuff happen here at third stage if you're interested. So, so be sure that to, to message me if it is something you're interested in pursuing or talking about in more detail, or if you have general um, questions or, or advice that you're looking for, um, love to hear from you. So thank you for joining here today. I really appreciate you being part of this discussion. Again, this discussion will become part of Transformation Ground Control podcast. It gets released a week from tomorrow, Wednesday of next week. Be sure to subscribe to that podcast if you don't already. I, I'm totally biased, but I think it's an awesome podcast. Um, you'll see me there if, if, you, if you like these sorts of conversations. And uh, be sure to follow us there. Check out our website at thirdstage-consulting.com. I uh, hope you found this information useful. We've got a lot of great live streams coming up uh, Tuesdays, same time, same place. So be sure to check out the schedule. Watch my social media because we've got great guests coming up to talk about emerging technologies. Uh, we've got the chief technology officer of Infor that's going to be on here in a couple of weeks. Um, we have um, uh, one of our team members that's going to be on. Uh, talking about uh, just some of the, the nuances of, of digital transformation. So a lot of different topics we cover related to digital transformation. Be sure to check, check it out and join the live stream every week and uh, check out the podcast too. So hope you all have a great day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the great feedback and comments, and we will see you all next time. Have a great week in the meantime. Take care.